you say all that again? That's all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I've been here eight weeks, and I didn't think that, that <laughs> would be all right. Right. So that revelation is a human act entirely, that it is not divinely inspired, that it does not come from God. It is a, quote, quickening of the human conscience. That is not what we believe. We, and evangelical Christianity, any who take the Bible seriously, for instance, would say that revelation is something that comes from God. If it does not come from God, then we have no assurance that what we believe is true. That's foundational to everything else we believe. Okay? And yet, it's one of the things that gets challenged most is how do we know? You know revelation. I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the philosophical developments from the Enlightenment on down that have caused us to have kind of a messed up idea of what revelation is, in fact, of what any human knowledge is and where it comes from. So, we've said what revelation is, what is it not? Revelation is not concerned with knowledge that we once had and somehow have forgotten. This idea, and this is part of the quickening of the conscience, some people say, well, we're rediscovering truths that used to exist and then humanity got busy and forgot about. That's not true. Revelation, we believe, is a consistent thing that God has done in history, and there's an extent to which God continues to reveal himself in history. There's an extent to which, and I want to be careful about this, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, an extent to which revelation is progressive, meaning God reveals himself more as we're ready for it. And, well, let me say this right now. An example would be, why is it that God had this plan for the Hebrews and then Jesus came later? Right? Why is it that that it seems as though God has gotten more refined in his communication with us. Well, it's not because God has changed, it's because we have changed. Because human society, to some extent, has prepared us more for it. Human beings have not gotten better. People are not better now than they were in the Old Testament. Human beings have always been broken. We have always been prone to sin. Society has gotten a little better at keeping us from busting out and doing all the horrible things we want to do. So culture has gotten more refined and perhaps more controlling. People haven't changed. But God over time has revealed himself differently. Why do we no longer have to sacrifice animals in order for God's forgiveness to be available to us? Because God has revealed himself to some extent in a progressive revelation. You have to take that cautiously. Because while there is evidence in scripture, I think, that God reveals things as, as, as we go along... Um, Jesus even talks about the reason that Moses did some things is because the people were very hard of heart, you know. So Jesus even sort of explained that things, things may have changed some in people. But a lot of people take the idea of progressive revelation and use that as an excuse for making modern sins acceptable. Or modern ideas which are not consistent with scripture acceptable. While God has revealed himself in a progressive way, meaning we have learned more and, the, and it's developed and we've grown more and God has revealed more of himself as he went along, particularly in the Incarnation, nothing that God revealed previously has been uh, countermanded in terms of things that used to be sin are no longer okay, are not okay now, right? A big example would be um, Scripture... I'm going to go leave preaching and go to meddling here for some people. Um, the idea of homosexual behavior. Some people say that the practice of homosexual lifestyle is okay now when it didn't used to be, even in New Testament times. It's not all Old Testament, by the way. You know, uh, Romans and other places are very clear about this. They say, well, progressive revelation means that it maybe it used to be wrong, but now it's not anymore because God has revealed to us that this is okay now. Something that is clearly established in the New Testament as having been sinful has not been made okay by progressive revelation. That's why we have to be cautious about that. Yet still, still when we read the whole of Scripture, we, we do see that God has revealed more of himself over a period of time, especially in the Incarnation. That wasn't the first time that God revealed himself to us. That's, he did that with Adam, and he did it with Noah, and he did it with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he did it with Moses, and he did it with the prophets. And then he revealed the most of himself in becoming a human being in the Incarnation. That's the way in which, for instance, um, Revelation has been progressive. But it is not progressive in terms of us now being able to say things that we want that are contrary to Scripture are now okay. And that's the way some people use that. Pro the idea of progressive Revelation has been especially uh, popular amongst Charismatics because their belief is that the expression of the Charismatic gifts 
is a, a, a kind of new revelation from God, and that God gives new revelations, and I don't have a problem with that, as long as they don't carry that too far and say, well, God has now revealed, because that same progressive revelation is what convinced, jo convinced Joseph Smith, and he convinced everybody else that God had given him, when he founded the Mormon Church, the first real truth about who God is, because God was, was uh, revealing himself progressively. And David Koresh, you know, the, the French Davidians, God has given me, by progressive revelation, an understanding of this that nobody else has ever had. Every cult basically is arguing a progressive revelation kind of idea, that God gave me the truth and he hasn't before. That is not what we believe. Is that fair? You guys understand the difference there? Okay. Uh, so, it's not concerned with knowledge that we once had somehow have forgotten. It is not the kind of knowledge that can be obtained by research or by pu pure human effort. Now, we're going to talk about a kind of revelation that is available to everybody, that everyone can, can understand and see and perceive. But it's not because of human effort. It's not like we can go out and discover everything that we need to know about God by our own effort. That's not the way it works. That's not what revelation is. Okay? Revelation comes to us from outside ourselves. And especially in regard to special revelation, one of the two kinds of revelation, which I will explain in a minute, is beyond our ability to discover by our own power. Okay, revelation is from God to us. It is not from the inside of us. That's why we don't believe that, that revelation is a quickening of the human conscience. Because what would that be? That would say that revelation comes from inside us and we express it outwardly. That's not what revelation is. Revelation comes from outside. It's something God reveals to us that we then can take in and understand. Got it? <clears throat> now fundamentally, our belief is that we have a God who speaks. We talked about that when we talked about theology of God. That God is a God who communicates. How do we know that? Well, we have record that God spoke to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to and through Moses, to and through the rest of the prophets, Moses being the, the sort of model for all the prophets later, that God spoke through the incarnation of Christ, that he literally communicated, that he spoke and revealed himself when Jesus became incarnate as a baby, that God spoke to and through the apostles, not only in their preaching, like when Peter preached at, uh, in the second chapter of Acts, when Paul preached, but also through the apostles who wrote the letters, the books. Um, he spoke through some who weren't actually apostles, like Luke, who wrote two of the books of the, of the New Testament, or James, who wasn't an apostle. The James who wrote the, the book of James is not the same as James the Apostle, okay? Or the writer of Hebrews, etc. So he spoke through the apostles and the other scriptural writers. And then God spoke and continues to speak, we believe, through the Holy Spirit. Fundamental to our belief about revelation, our uh, doctrine or theology of revelation, and I use those two words interchangeably. Uh, a doctrine usually is a, a, a written statement of theology that is accepted as a principle on which your faith is built. But um, a doctrine, so doctrine is just a way of capturing what our theology is. So when we talk about theology of revelation or doctrine of revelation, I use those interchangeably. Because we say God is a, is a God who speaks, we also have an assumption in there that God is a person. We talk about the three persons of the Trinity. By person, we mean a being that is a personality, that has a personality, that can be known, that is relationally oriented. He is a person. You'll notice I use a capital P because actually he's the person, you might say. And because God is a person, that, that really affects our understanding of the doctrine of revelation. As is true in relationship with any person, there are things about God that we can only know because he tells us. If you and I have a relationship, there are things inside going on in my head and in my heart and in my life that unless I tell you, you're not going to know them. In fact, unless I choose to reveal myself to you as a person, you're never going to really know very much about me at all. You can follow me around from now till the cows come home, and there's a very limited amount of who I am as a person that you're going to understand unless I tell you. In the same way... God is a person who has related to us and has communicated with us so that we might know him. That's the point. It's also true, however, that God is transcendent. Remember, we're going back now to the doctrine of God issues. God is transcendent, which means he is high above us. He is different from us. And so, critical to our doctrine of revelation, 
we can only really know about God if he condescends to speak to us. Now, condescension here is not a negative word. Usually when people say condescend or condescending, that's a negative. You know, that's a, that means you're, you're patronizing me. No, what the word actually means is simply that he's come down to our level. That God has come down to our level in order to speak to us, to communicate to us. Because by his nature, he is transcendent. He is wholly other. And yet, part of our doctrine of revelation is that God has chosen to accommodate himself, is another way we talk about that, or condescend in the way in which he communicates to us, so that we can know about him. In effect, the doctrine of revelation maintains as a fundamental principle that rather than God waiting for us to figure out and learn about him, which we're not able to do, by the way, because God is transcendent, it is not within our power as finite beings to achieve a real understanding of God. Because that's true, God took the initiative and rather communicated to us. That's the condescension, the accommodation, that God chose to reveal himself, to communicate with us about who he is as a person, what his will has been, and how he has acted in history. Okay? And then, it's important to note that God created us as rational, communicative beings, most of us. Um, so it is reasonable to expect that he would communicate with us in rational ways, that is, in words that we can understand. Again, I'm going to get, talk a little bit later about some of the mistakes and problems that we've run into with people's understanding of Revelation. One of them is the idea that, God, that God's revelation is not in propositional truths. It's not in words that you can understand, in concepts that you can, you can articulate, but rather it's all sort of inside. It's all emotional. It's all feeling. You know, that we experience God not by learning truths about God or hearing words from God, but rather by experiencing Him. Well, it's true that we experience God, but we, but we have to also maintain the idea that God has spoken to us in ways we can reasonably and rationally understand in order to understand the principles of who He is and what He needs for us to know about Him or wants for us to know about Him. Okay? So God is a person and He has communicated with us in a way that's consistent with a person. Even the middle one, the idea that God is transcendent and He condescends to speak to us. The language that I use talking to you all about Old Testament theology is not the language that I would use to speak to my two-year-old grandnephew. Right? Or, let me give you a more, um, an example perhaps you can relate to. I, we've had people who worked for us who spoke Spanish and know English, and my, you know, hablo pero un poquito el español, so I don't speak that much Spanish. We have had a few people who worked for us whose Spanish I got none of. It's just like, okay? They spoke really quickly and they used words I did not understand and it's completely over my head. We've had other people who work for us, like our gardener, Armando, speaks no uh, English, and yet he and I talk all the time. And I understand fully because the words that he uses, the language he uses with me, he talks to me like I'm a little kid in terms of not using words that, he, you know, that I won't understand. And he's got a sense of how much Spanish I have. And so he speaks to me consistent with how I'm able to understand. That's exactly what God does with us. Okay? God speaks to us in a way that we can understand because he's a person who is making a judgment about how he can best communicate with us. Right? We experience the same thing in our lives. It's because we have a personal approach to how we communicate with one another. Okay, let's talk about the two forms or basic forms of revelation now. This is based, I should say this is based uh, primarily, the, the best articulation is a better way to put that. The best articulation of what I'm about to tell you now was made by Thomas Aquinas, who was the great Catholic scholastic scholar, um, a monk, a brilliant philosopher as well. In fact, he did a lot with the, the uh, philosophical or rational arguments for the existence of God. Um, and interestingly enough, although he was a Catholic scholar, most evangelical understanding of the doctrine of revelation is based upon Thomas Aquinas' um, initial thinking on this. Uh, John Calvin, the founder of, or the, the author, the source of Reformed theology on which the Presbyterian Church is built, looked very specifically and, and, and picked up everything Aquinas had said and sort of added to it, but very much agreed that Aquinas had it right. And Aquinas is the one who first articulated that there are two different kinds 
uh, divine revelation, or the first one I'm aware of, the one who really did it in a way that he's the one everybody refers to. The first form of divine revelation is called general revelation. General revelation is the idea that God reveals aspects of his truth through natural means, quote unquote. That is, by us observing the created physical universe, by philosophy and reasoning, by human conscience, and providential history. Providential history means the history that God clearly is controlling. Providential history is the way in which we can see God working in history. And all of that is plainly available to humankind. It means that if we look out at the world, there are aspects of God's reality and of God's presence in the world and of what God has done in the world that's available to us, whether we are Christians or Jews or anything else. Every person who's paying attention can see these things. And I'll give you a, a couple of verses. I'm going to break this out and, and talk about general revelation for a while and then special revelation. So I'll get to some of the defenses of this in a minute, some of the explanation of this. The second kind of revelation is called special revelation, sometimes called specific revelation, which means the same thing. Special revelation is God's revealing of particular and specific aspects of his truth through supernatural means, if you will. The first one was natural means, that is the created universe, philosophy and reasoning, human conscience, providential history, that's general revelation. Specific or special revelation is God revealing aspects of his truth through supernatural means, such as miracles, direct communication to people, like the prophets, for instance, or the gospel, or the, the Bible scripture writers, or through the written scripture, that it is a living thing that God continues to speak through. Special revelation is especially concerned with matters of redemption. How, do we, how can we be made right in our relationship with God? It is not possible for us to gain any meaningful understanding of redemption of either what General revelation, just human reason, tells everybody at some point, if they're paying attention, that there's something wrong with them. But general revelation can't tell them what it is that's wrong with them, nor can they tell them what to do about it. Only special revelation can do that. Fair? Every culture that we know about throughout all of human history has had as a basic belief this idea that there's something wrong with us. So you don't have to have a special revelation from God in order to have a sense of that or every culture in every part of the world would not have had that in, in common. But to know what it is that's wrong with us, that is original sin, the fall, and to know what to do about it to, to make us right again, which is to bring us, we know, is to bring us back into relationship with God, only special revelation can do that for us. All right? Clear? Everybody's looking a little glazed. Maybe it's just Wednesday afternoon, okay? So let's talk about general revelation. I'll give you a couple of scripture verses here that are frequently referred to when people uh, talk about special revelation or general revelation. Excuse me. Psalm 19 says, "The heavens declare, declare the glory of God; the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech; night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth; their words to the end of the world." God has spoken, so to speak. He has revealed himself in the glory of his creation. We'll talk in a few minutes about uh, in what way has he revealed himself. Um, but, you know, back to the Psalms. God has shown us that there is a God by making all of this and putting it all together. The, the silliness and pride of humanity to believe that this is all an accident. You know? <laughs> And those are the only words I can use is silliness and pride. Pride being the part where we don't want to admit that there's somebody bigger and better than us, being God. And so we have to try to find human explanations for all of this. And yet, I believe Scripture is true. Anybody that's, that's even halfway objective and looks at the glory of the world and says, accident? Really? Okay. Another verse that's often quoted about general revelation is Romans 1, 19 and 20. Since what may, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. God has, by His creation, shown us something about himself and something about um, us 
in terms of our being so small in terms of the scale of what God has created. So these are examples from Scripture of a testament to the idea of general revelation, that through the created world, through philosophy and reasoning, through human conscience and providential history, that God has revealed himself, especially by the things he has made and done that we can see and experience. Leon Morris, a Protestant theologian, I'm sorry, you can't see all of that. This thing gets so... Um, we moving it forward now, or... Probably backwards. No, backwards. backwards. Yeah. And I'll probably mess up the top of it. That'll be okay. Uh, that's a little better. Leon Morris, as a theologian, has written, A reverent contemplation of the physical universe with its order and design and beauty tells us not only that God is, but also that God is a certain kind of God. The God who created is a God who apparently loves beautiful things because he made them beautiful. He is a God who likes, who is an orderly God because things are in order. You know, human, human science started with the idea of trying to classify things into different groupings in an orderly way because they seem to naturally occur that way. So there are things that we can perceive about God as we go along. Now, um, continuing general revelation, general, general revelation works in part because God made humanity, all human beings, in his image, and in doing so, he left his imprint on humanity. In other words, our ability to perceive the things of God and what he has made and what he has done in general revelation has to do with the fact that there is in us some aspect in which we are all, whether we know it or not, whether we admit it or not, made in the image of God. We have the ability to recognize the nature of God because we have some of it in ourselves. I sometimes have said it's as though when God made us in his image, there is a flame that is in each of us, the flame which is the part of us that is like God. For some, that flame is so dim as to barely even be in existence. And for some, that's a bonfire in which the, the nature, the presence, the reality of being made in the image of God is the dominant thing in their whole existence. Most of us are somewhere in between. But in all of us, because all human beings are made in the image of God, there is some aspect in us in which that uh, image is still present. And that's what allows us to be able to recognize, if we're willing, the nature of God in general revelation in the revealed world. Now. You've heard me say probably, and Carolyn, if she weren't in the States, if she were here, she would attest to this, because she's heard this 10,000 times in the last 19 years. Um, the biggest failing of human beings is not paying attention. For all sorts of reasons. I mean, that's why most relationships get screwed up. But that's also why we are unable to see the things of God in the created universe, because we're just not paying attention. If we did pay attention, we would be overawed by the beauty and the majesty and the significance and the order of all that God has done in a way that we would be pulled up short and say, there's something behind this. Now, it won't give us the specific answer of what that is, but it would call us to an understanding, as the passages I just gave you from Psalm 19 and Roman, and Roman says, that yes, there is a God behind this. Now, this idea that there is imprinted in us um, a, an ability to recognize the things of God in general revelation. John Calvin and others, but particularly Calvin, maintain that an immediate knowledge of God is based on our being made in his image and on what he called common grace. Common grace is a very important theological um, doctrine in a number of ways, particularly having to do with revelation. Common grace is the idea that there are certain benefits which are experienced by, bless you, or intended for the entire human race without distinction. Common grace includes the ways in which, and here I'm quoting Louis, uh, uh, Louis Burkhoff. Burkhoff, however, is actually um, summarizing Calvin, so this is really Calvin's idea. Common grace includes the way in which God curbs the destructive power of sin, maintains in a measure the moral order of the universe, thus making an orderly life possible, distributes in varying degrees gifts and talents among men, promotes the development of science and art, and showers untold blessings upon the children of men. Basically what we're saying here is, given the fallenness of humanity, why is it that we still have so much beauty? That we can still experience love and joy, even the unsaved can experience joy in relationship. 
why is it that when creation is fallen, and it is, that we still have so much beauty and so much glory that we can enjoy, that everybody can enjoy, not just those who are redeemed? Why is it that given the nature of sin, the nature of fallenness, that the whole world just doesn't fly into pieces at any minute? That still life goes on, life continues, children are born and raised, people love each other, there is music. Why is all that stuff in a fallen world? Well, there's an aspect of that, that, that is what, what common grace entails. That there's an, a sense in which God has still maintained enough of a presence that all things don't simply come to an explosive end at any given moment. All right, God continues not in, you know, it's still a fallen world. There is still sin, there is still pain and grief, and yet there also is beauty and glory in the world. That's common grace. That's as, as When people experience that, that's common grace. It's because, for instance, of common grace that other religions, and common grace is a reflection of the general revelation, that's how it is that some religions, not just Christianity or even Judaism, but some religions seem to contain some truth about God. You know, they will have a sense of that. If you look at primitive religions, for instance, many of them have this idea that there is a great spirit who made everything that is, and that we owe that spirit some sense of worship, and, you know, whatever else it is. You, you all have read the, the uh, was it Don Richardson, was, it was the author of the book Peace Child. Mm -hmm. He was working as a missionary in primitive cultures, and he was trying to figure out how he could communicate the truth about Jesus to these people who had no concept. They actually were, were a very warring, tribal kind of thing. And they didn't really understand doing something because it was the right thing to do if it didn't gain an advantage. Well, he discovered that they had a, 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 um, a thing called a concept, a legend, if you will, of the peace child, where someone gave a child to another tribe as a gesture of peace for them to raise that child, and that the giving up of a son, a child, was sufficient to bring peace. And he went, that's Jesus. That's the perfect analogy for Jesus. That God, who is the control of everything, gave up his son in order to bring peace to those who would accept it. Okay? And so we find that in religions, even not Judeo-Christian religion, that there many times are kernels of truth, nuggets of reality about God and the truth of God which there's no other explanation for other than to say that there is a sense in which that's a common grace, a general revelation, there's a natural perception. If you want to get psychoanalytic about it, um, uh, Jung, Carl Jung, the, the, psych, the psychiatrist who sort of took over after, um, after Freud, I mean he didn't take over from Freud, he really discounted most of what Freud had to say, rightly so, but Jung talked about the fact that there is a cosmic unconscious, there appears to be a cosmic unconsciousness which means that somehow in all of human culture and history there seems to be certain things everybody kind of perceives and understands. Well, that's a non-Christian way of saying general revelation and common grace. That cultures everywhere have certain things they seem to inherently have a sense of. It's also true the idea of common grace is why it is that people who are not religious people, who are not redeemed, can still choose to be good and act compassionately. Somebody who's not a religious person at all, who still does good things, what's, how, how does that work if they are completely fallen and the world is completely fallen? Because even they are recipients of this, this sense of common grace, that God has not completely you know, annihilated our sense of what is good and right in the universe. Okay? So what can be known by general revelation? Well, just a few things. There's a lot more than this. In fact, some people go much further on this than I, than I would maintain. They, they talk about very specific understandings about God that can be perceived, and I, I'm not sure I go that far. But it's true, I believe, if we look at the universe and, we're, and the created order and our own uh, rationality, we can determine there is a God. There is some being that is greater than us that made this. It didn't just happen. We can see that this is a powerful God, and He is a creator God. So we can begin to learn something about the nature of God. When we look at the beauty and the grace that's in so many things, despite, despite the, the pain and the death as well, we could say he is a good God. He designed things and it appears as though he intended for them to be good, but that there's something wrong. Um, as we look out, we can see that there are standards that seem to be inherent in the world just by what we look at, the standards of beauty. 
There's a, a uni universal, except for sociopaths or others, there seems to be a universal appreciation for things that are beautiful. So there's, there's a sense in which that's a general revelation. Uh, a stand, standards of right and wrong. Some things clearly are right and wrong. There's never been a culture anywhere that thought it was okay to eat your own children. Um, so the sense in which there's certain things that are right and certain things are wrong, the idea that there, is a, there are concepts like goodness and righteousness and loyalty and honor have been pretty much universal in all cultures. And, as I said earlier, this universal sense that there is something wrong with us. Those are the kinds of things that I believe general revelation tells us. In fact, in the book Mere Christianity, which if you've not read Mere Christianity, then you need to repent. <laughs> Go read it. Um, second only to the Bible, I think, in terms of books of significance for English-speaking Christians. In Mere Christianity, Lewis makes a very compelling argument that when somebody says, when somebody sees something go wrong, a, a young mother killed in an accident or, or uh, an act of violence, or when, they, when they say, that's just not right, it shouldn't be like that. Lewis makes the point, well, where do you get that? <clears throat> Human existence is so full of that, where do we get this idea that there's something inherently inappropriate or wrong or displaced about those kinds of things occurring in the world. How can we say that's not right when that happens all the time? And Lewis, much better than I'm doing right now, makes the argument that that's an evidence of an inherent moral law, that every human being has inside them some kind of yardstick, whether they know it or not, and whether they have anything they would base it on or not, some sense in which all of us say some things are right and good and some things are wrong and bad. Where does that come from? Unless there truly is some, some cannon, some yardstick, some mark that's outside of us, that part of it is we're aware of it because of being made in the image of God. That's the common grace kind of thing. Lewis makes, a, I think, a very compelling argument to that. The very nature of how we respond to pain in the world is a sign of the fact that that's not how it was meant to be. You know, as Lewis brilliantly said, he said, if we find ourselves unable to be satisfied with the things in this world, perhaps it's because we were not made for this world. We were made for a different world, a world in which those things didn't exist. And if we're paying attention to our reaction to things, then that's one of the indicators to us that there is something beyond just what we perceive in our senses. Okay? Questions about that? Yes. Well, this yes. is about the common grace. Is common grace understood like, it, like it's from Calvin, certainly the Presbyterians, but do most other denominations believe common grace, or is that something that's kind of debated? Well, it's kind of core. What's that? It's kind of core. Well, it? it's, it's absolutely core to Calvin and Reformed theology. Whether it's called that or not, almost every um, religious system has to have some way to try to explain, for instance, why do unredeemed people choose to do good things. All right. So common grace may not be the word that they use for it, but this idea that there remains a sense. Now, the very liberal, those who would not, who would not believe in divine revelation anyway, would say, well, you know, that people are basically good, you know, that, that, that it's an expression of the basic goodness of humanity. Well, we don't believe in the basic goodness of humanity. We believe the fall is total, you know, that we are, as my old friend uh, Tim Waits used to say, if I'm basically good, then why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? And yet, people, unredeemed people, still do good acts. And so every religious system, whether they call it common grace or not, has some effort in which they try to explain the nature of those things. So it's not just Calvin, but I think he's the one that articulated it best, and the one who's most often quoted about that. Okay? Yes, John? This doesn't have to do with that. It, it has to do with the transcendence and the imminence. Transcendence, transcendence being, you know, that... that God that's unreachable and the eminence is his bowing down or, or you know coming down to, our to us yeah eminence you have here written with an eye and you know you see you see occasionally on TV or, or in the newspaper where um, this is maybe a dumb question I don't know but they, they'll re, they'll uh, address like a cardinal your eminence. That's a but different word. That's with an E. Yeah. Where, where's, is, are they just giving like, they're not saying. That's a different word. Eminence means your grandness. Okay. It's with actually e. the opposite with an E. 
It's the opposite of imminent with an I. Imminent with an I means close to us, you know, common to us, available to us. Imminence with an E is like your highness. Okay. It's another way of saying your highness or your, you know, and, and that's used for cardinals or people at senior senior levels in the Catholic Church especially, your eminence. But yeah, it's a completely different word. And it's interesting that it is a word that they use when it's not. People can be confused with that. Yeah, it's yeah. not the word we use for God. So. Right. <laughs> um, so, again, sort of summing that up, we believe that by general revelation, we can know what's wrong with us. We can see evidence of God in the world. Um, but we can't know specifically, uh, we, we can know, I'm sorry, we can know there is something wrong with us, but we cannot know by general revelation specifically what it is that's wrong with us, and we cannot know how to be reconciled to God. You know, how, what do we then do about that? Okay. Um, I want to go on now to special revelation, unless there's some other questions about this one. We'll get started on this, and then I want to, we'll take a break, and I want to come back and give you some sort of historical background as to where people have gone in terms of our understanding of God's revealing himself to us. Um, special revelation, I want to start with some, some of the scripture verses. Uh, let me find my sheet here, I just covered it up. Well, I don't see David, so I'll have to read from up here. Oh, wait, here it is. From Amos 3.7, the idea of special revelation, again, is that God has given us specific, even supernatural communications of specific things he wants us to know. He has done it by speaking directly to us, by demonstrating himself in miracles, like the burning bush, for instance, which was both a voice and an event, and by um, the written word that he has given us in the Old and New Testament. Amos 3.7, talking about special revelation, says, Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plan to His servants, the prophets. Especially as we talk about Old Testament and the doctrine of revelation or the theology of revelation, God spoke through the prophets. There, there's an extent to which you could say, uh, well, the Islamic faith counts Adam as a prophet and Noah as a prophet and Abraham as a prophet. And on down the line, all of those were prophets by some consideration because they were spoken to by God and spoke for God to some extent. And so God has revealed himself through special revelation, specific kinds of information given to those down through history. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Back to that idea that special revelation is how God teaches us to how, what's wrong with us specifically and how to be redeemed. Jesus says, the Father reveals the Son, and the Son reveals the Father. That's a special revelation. Matthew 16 says, Simon Peter answered, when, when asked, who do you say that I am, of course. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. That was a special revelation of the reality of Jesus as the divine Son of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 10 says, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. And then 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21 says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never has its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The writing of Scripture is one of the most specific and pointed ways in which special revelation occurs, as the Holy Spirit speaks to people in order to capture God's will and word for us to read. And we have, um, you know, we have examples, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, others, where God specifically says, write down what I tell you. Well, the only reason for writing stuff down is so that somebody can read it. And that's the way in which God has revealed directly to those who wrote uh, the scripture, and then indirectly, but still a special revelation to us through the scripture. Okay? So, special revelation, I'm quoting Carl Henry here now. Special revelation is redemptive revelation. Remember I said earlier that special revelation is especially concerned with how we are redeemed or reconciled to God. 
It publishes the good tidings that the holy and merciful God promises salvation as a divine gift to man who cannot save himself. That's consistent with the Old Testament. The, the Israelites could not bring themselves, themselves up out of captivity in Egypt. God had to do it by acting miraculously, especially through Moses. And that he has now fulfilled that promise and the gift of his Son in whom all men are called to believe, the New Testament. So from the very start, God has revealed himself in special revelation for the purpose of, of redeeming. And that redemption has been from the start. In effect, re redeeming Adam and Eve after their fall, redeeming Noah and his family, and all of creation after Noah, of um, redeeming especially the Israelites through the giving of the law in, in Exodus at Mount Sinai. So we need to understand special revelation is the communication of not of nature to us, not of our own rationality to us, not of, of history to us, but special revelation is the communication of one person, capital P, which means God, to other persons in a number of ways. It is, a, it is an interpersonal communication, special revelation. And whereas general revelation is a perception that comes from a larger uh, awareness of what is in the world. Particularly, special revelation is verbal and propositional, meaning God has spoken to us creatures in words. Remember, earlier we were talking about condescension, accommodation, that we, he made us rational and he speaks to us in rational ways, in using sentences and words. Um, rational ideas have been put forward in understandable sentences. Implicit in this is an understanding that revelation contains propositional truths, that revelation includes statements that are informative and have truth value. Now, why did, I, why did I bother to say that to you? That may seem like a given, but it's not to everybody. As I mentioned earlier, um, there are some, and I'm gonna, we're going to take a break in a few minutes because I'm going to come back and give you kind of the history of how we got there. There are some who would insist that God's revelation does not involve propositional truths. Propositional truths are statements about something that we deem to be true. Some people today would insist that the real revelation of God is not in the things that we've been told that, as being truths, but rather in our experience of God. Let me give you the next, and then we'll come back to this. Um, this the idea of it being verbal and propositional is contrary to some modern ideas, I'm going to talk about Rudolf Bultmann in a minute, that God's revelation must be seen as more, uh, more God's revelation must be seen as more than, uh, I, I'll get this straight in a second. God's revelation is more than just relational personal encounter, but Bultmann and others have said that the revelation of God is something you feel, it's something you experience. It doesn't have to do with propositional truths, meaning it doesn't have to do with doctrine. It doesn't have to do with statements of truth about God and about His will. It has to do with experiencing it. And as I put up there, the, the, as in, don't bother me with doctrine, I just want to have a relationship with Jesus. Well, now it's true that you can get so focused on the propositional truths of doctrine you know, the things, the statements that we believe about God and about us and about what God wants for us, you can get so wrapped up in those propositional statements that you miss out on the relationship. But it's also true that you can get so wrapped up in the relationship part that you forget that there are some things that are true and there are some things that are false. Most of the, the, the immature Christians today who don't grow in their faith, who are so experientially oriented, it's because they have failed to realize there are some things we are told about God that are true. And we need to establish those as truths and anchor ourselves in them. Too often what happens is that people say, oh, well, you know, I just love Jesus and I just feel this so much. I use my southern accent because that happens a lot in the south. <laughs> Without realizing that we need to have a doctrinal, a, 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 a theological a reasonable understanding of God and the nature of God. And that's why he gave it to us in words, in sentences, in propositional truths. Why he told us certain things about himself that we are supposed to know and remember. But some people, and, and that gets reflected in how people react to things. Uh, twice I have had people approach me, uh, and I've mentioned this before, I've mentioned the baptism thing, right? About why we say that to take communion you, you need to be a baptized believer in Jesus. 
twice I've had people say, well, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Because people, it doesn't matter whether you're baptized or not, you should be able to come forward and take communion. And I say, well, why? And they go, well, it just feels wrong to say you should be baptized. And yet I can give you scriptural support for that. And when I tried to do it with one person, they, they didn't want to hear it. No, well, it just, I, I just know it's wrong. It feels wrong inside. You know what? That's the foundation of almost every cult that's ever been. Well, it's based upon what I feel. Because I don't, I don't want to have to deal with doctrines or truths or propositional statements about God and the nature of truth and the nature of God. I only want to deal with what feels good. And that's one of the things, I, I, I do not discount the charismatic experience, the gifts of the Holy Spirit I believe are for today, and so don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I have had a number of charismatic friends who were very immature, and I think the reason is because their whole orientation toward their experience of the Christian faith was just that, an experience of the Christian faith. That when they weren't feeling the joy of the Holy Spirit, then they were lost. They didn't know what to do with themselves because they didn't have anything to fall back on. They didn't have any understanding or any, any, any clear knowledge of what God has told about himself if they didn't have it, if it didn't feel good right now. Well, you know what? If we, were, if we base all of our um, religious faith, all of our belief on just what feels good, you're going to get messed up pretty quick. You're going to have a real bad meal and feel really awful, and all of a sudden your faith is in question. There are propositional truths that we have to hold to. Right. That would explain a, a problem that I have knowing some very fine people that don't go to church. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, I, it's, I had a very good friend. I've talked about it, Richard Sears. Um, someday Richard's going to be shocked if he ever sees these tapes and see how many times I mention his name, but I haven't talked to him in 25 years. Um, he's a dear friend. I love him to death. But um, Richard one time said to me, he was one of my college professors who I found out was a Christian, didn't know it even though I'd known him well, and, and we worked through all that. Richard said to me one time, you know, he said, i a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Lord, I want to worship Him, but I don't care if I never go to a church again. I don't care if I never set foot in church again. I am tired of the hypocrisy, and, the, and I don't need that. I don't need those people. I am not going there. And I looked at him and said, well, Richard, that's an awfully selfish thing to, get to say. Did, you ever, did it ever occur to you that maybe they need you? Even if you don't think you need them? You're not going there just for you. You're going there to be part of the body of Christ. And Scripture says everybody is given gifts for the sake of the body. There's something that you have that they need. So don't make the mistake that thinking it's all about you. And that's the, the problem that when we get into this idea that it's all personal encounter, then we forget that it's about God first, and that He has done us the great mercy of allowing us to be involved in that. It all becomes about me. It's all me and what my experience is, and my relationship with Jesus, and my sense of God's presence, and my fulfilling spiritual life. You know what? It's not about me. I am grateful that God has allowed me to participate with Him, but it's about Him first. You'll hear us, if you attend our church, you'll hear us pray over and over, Lord, do not let us make the mistake of starting to think that this church is about us. It's not. It's about you and the glory you deserve. Okay? And yet that's one of the most common mistakes today. I could name three or four denominations who fundamentally have it wrong in terms of understanding what the purpose of the church is, what the purpose of the Christian experience is. And it all boils down to this idea of not believing or not understanding that there are certain propositional truths. There are certain things that are true about God, and He's communicated those things to us for a reason. Because He wants us to know it and not forget it. I've shared the example I did consulting. Forgive me if I've told you all this story. I, I've got a number of different classes and groups, and I forget who I tell what. But I was doing consulting work with a, a church down in Southern California, and it was um, a fellowship church. <laughs> Meaning it was not denominational. They did not have any historical grounding, really. It was started by two couples. Bless you. Uh, two couples, and then it had grown to like 1,500 people, you know, and they had a, like a 19-piece rock band, you know, as part of worship and the whole thing. Again, I don't have anything. That's not my style, but I have nothing against that, per se. But I was meeting with the elders because they invited me to come down as a consultant and help them identify what their, you know, what their mission needed to be. Turns out what, they're, what they were asking, actually asking me is the founder of the church had written a popular book and had gotten a lot of attention, including like 60 Minutes kind of stuff on this. And 
he was looking for the next big thing for him, I think, to be quite honest about it. All right. Um, while meeting with the elders, one of the elders tells me that his wife was part of a women's group. Have I told you this? And they wanted to baptize each other, but they wanted to do it in private. They wanted to do it in, a, in one of their swimming pools, and they didn't want anybody to know about it. And they asked him because he was an elder, and he said, sure, that's fine, go ahead. And he's telling me this, and I'm thinking, holy moly, you don't have a clue. The best definition in Scripture of what it means to be saved is if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And he just gave them permission to keep it a secret that they, not only that, but they're being baptized without anybody checking to make sure that they didn't, didn't think they were getting baptized into the God of the rocks and the trees and the flowers and of the, you know, of the, of the Mother Earth kind of stuff, right? They had no clue what they were being baptized into, as far as I know, and they were violating a basic principle of Scripture that you're supposed to confess your faith in Jesus before the body. And yet they said, okay, sure, fine. Why? Because they were a church that believed that the whole thing was, if you feel it, if it feels good, then it's right. Without regard for the fact that there are certain things that Scripture tells us to do and not to do. There are propositional truths that we're supposed to abide by. And they completely got it wrong. And you know what my fear was? I didn't know any of these women. I didn't meet them. I met his wife, actually, but I didn't meet any others. My fear was that those, one or more of those women would go through the rest of their life thinking they were fine and not know Jesus. Because nobody even talked to them about that before they got baptized and thought they were okay. You see my point? We believe there are propositional truths associated with this revelation of God. Did somebody have a hand up? John, uh, somebody might have had it. I, I was just going to. Um, you know, in, in in my journey with the Lord, I've seen I've seen we're wired to kind of fall on one side of the fence or the other. Just as there are those who are so enamored with pursuing feelings and excitement, and next Sunday has to be more exciting than this yeah, Sunday. What's the next big thing? Yeah, the next big thing. There are also those who are just uh, living a drudged life of yoked obedience without the experiential joy that comes with Christianity. Right. And what I, I see what I've seen is is when I look at these these propositional truths and this scripture, this this holy writ, it seems to me that the the most natural response to the born again child of God is an explosion of genuine admiration, love, obedience, and emotion of its truest kind fixed on what the author of this book, on the author of this book. I would propose, I'm just suggesting for your, your reflection, that, that when, we, when we grab these truths as, as they are meant to be given to mm -hmm. us, that the response to that is an engaging with the creator of the universe with obedience and not just dry, dust, dusty obedience, but with a, an immense joy and, and rejoicing in him right. that is very, very emotional. But it's pre predicated upon him and what he's written. It's not, I, I certainly agree with what you're saying. There's right. no. And I agree with what you're saying. I said earlier, it's, it's very possible to be so you know, down with all of the rules and with all the, okay, this, the doctrines of this is what we believe, you can't discount the experience of being a new creature in yeah. Christ for the sake of doctrine, nor, and this is the, often happens in modern churches especially, that you discount the truth of the propositional doctrines that God has given us about himself for the sake of just what feels good. Right. Okay. Let me give you a quote by somebody you'll appreciate, John J.I. Packer, who is one of my professors, and I know uh, John's a fan of his. Packer says, Revelation is, a, is certainly more than the giving of theological information, but it is not and cannot be less, meaning less than giving uh, of theological information. Personal, relation, personal friendship with God and man grows just as human relationships do, namely, through talking, and talking means information statements, and informative statements are, pro are propositions. To say that revelation is non-propositional is actually to depersonalize it. To maintain that we may know God without God actually speaking to us in words is really to deny God is personal and at any rate that knowing Him is a truly personal relationship. It, yes, we have a personal relationship with God, 
But like any other person, we can only know that if there's propositional information that's been communicated to us about him. And we've gotten to know him. And again, I mentioned that, you say, well, why are you beating that so much? That is the direction that we've been going for the last 300 years in terms of people's understanding of God and the, and the revelation of God, and so therefore how we relate to God. And we are now going to take a break. It's five minutes after. Uh, we will take a ten-minute break and come back at a quarter quarter after. Yeah, pay attention. To be completely fair, uh, I mentioned that that, and I'm speaking historically here. Some of the most mature Christians, some of the most um, the Christians that are most grounded in the historic propositional truths about the faith, meaning they understand why they believe what they believe, have been charismatic. And yet it has been my experience, more often than not, that charismatics, because the nature of the charismatic experience is a very emotional one, um, a lot of charismatic folks tend to be more emotionally oriented, the feeling of things, rather than the propositional, that there are certain truths that we need to hold to. Um, that's also true for a lot of the, the, the Bible church or fellowship church movement that has existed for the last 20 or 30 years that's really grown up more so. They tend to be more oriented toward that. That's the church I mentioned that the elders said it's fine for the women to baptize themselves and keep it private. Okay, Because he didn't have any sense of what the propositional truth, what scripture said about baptism and about confession of, of faith for salvation. Um, and so that's true. That's not universally true, and I'm not being negative about that because I've known people who were in mainline denominations who were just as messed up. In fact, I've quoted this before, sometimes the liberal scholars, for lack of anything else, will use exactly the same tact in trying to deny the principles of the Christian faith. I mentioned the program that I watched on the Jesus Seminar. Okay? And one of the supposed scholars in the Jesus Seminar says, well, you know, the Gospels say this. And he, he, he stated very briefly what the Gospels say. And then he looked off and said, but I prefer to think this. And I thought, who cares what you think? Just because you prefer the way that feels? You prefer the way that, you know, that that's, that's more satisfying to you? Completely without any reference. Completely without any propositional truth or evidential uh, documentation to support that? You just prefer to feel that way or think that way? So it's not, you know, sometimes it's the liberal scholars as much as it is uh, other folks who go away from this idea that there are propositional truths which are revealed to us and simply go with what they want. That's what it boils down to. What do I like better? What do I want? Well, you know what? Bottom line is it isn't what I like better and it isn't what I want. It's what God wants that counts. Ron? It's a relief sometimes to wake up in the morning and the person's uh, very grumpy and uh, what have you. A person like, is? A person is a little You're sitting next to your wife, so go ahead. And, and what have you in the midst of it. But you, you know your faith hasn't suffered. You know? yeah. I'm not sure what that meant, but okay. Just <laughs> <laughs> because bad doesn't mean that. Oh, exactly. Feelings don't drive everything. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and again, C.S. Lewis in Your Christianity, um, he said that there are times when the Christian faith doesn't seem all that likely. He said, but I have to recognize two things. One, that could just be the result of a bad meal yesterday. Okay. Or, I also have to remember that when I was not a Christian, there were times when the Christian faith seemed awfully likely. So we cannot base it just on how it feels. We've got to have more than that. I want to spend a few minutes now giving you sort of a, a 50 cent history of the development of philosophical foundations that led us to the place where we tend to, people tend to be more oriented in our culture to what feels good instead of what we are told by revelation is true. Okay? I want to go back first to the late 16th, early 17th century. <laughs> um, the time when the Enlightenment really started. The Enlightenment began with the idea that um, reason was the highest of all human faculties. The Enlightenment was the time of the elevation of, the, of the, both the regard and the expectations of the human capability, especially the human intellectual capability. You get people like Rene Descartes who um, ended up saying, I think, therefore I am. You've all heard that if you've ever taken a philosophy class or a history of, of European culture class or anything else. But most people don't realize what that means. When Kant said, I think, therefore I am, 
He was saying all aspects of my reality as a human being is founded on my rationality. Not upon my physical presence, not upon my historical you know, place in the, in, the, in the world, not upon my faith or feelings or anything else. Everything, my very existence, is based upon one thing, and that is my reason. I think, therefore I am. Without being able to be reasonable, or a reasonable, rational creature, I, don't even, I can't even claim to have existence. Okay? That that's the proof of it. That idea uh, in the enlightenment of reason being the highest of all faculties sort of started us down a road. And I want to give you a number of different phases in that road. The idea of reason being the only thing on which, not only the only thing on which I can depend upon my, my being real, but also the basis of all things that are true. Nothing else can bring truth other than my reason if you follow the enlightenment thinkers. This was, the, this was the time of great hubris, which is uncontrolled pride. The idea that the human mind and reason can achieve everything, and that there is nothing to compare with it. Obviously, that, makes, that takes a huge bite out of the idea that there is divine revelation. In fact, you follow that along, and you get to the place where uh, David Hume, who was one of my heroes back in my secular philosophy days, David Hume was a Scottish philosopher uh, who lived in the... the 1700s, 1711, 1776. Hume was an empiricist, meaning he he dealt for a long time with the reality of human experience being what you you know what you can measure, the experience of the senses. That's the empirical thing. But he really was kind of kicked, he kind of kicked off the school of skepticism because always, even with Kant and these other people thinking about reason, there was always a sense in which there was the reliability of cause and effect in the world. In other words, and this is actually the example that Hume used in his argument, if I'm shooting pool, playing billiards, and the cue ball hits another ball in a particular way, and that the other ball reacts in a certain way, if I'm able to always make that cue ball hit that ball in exactly the same place, exactly the same spin and everything, the other ball will react in an exactly predictable way. Cause and effect. The same cause will produce the same effect every time. Well, David Hume came along and made the argument which completely won the day in philosophy, that if you hit that cue ball and it hits that other ball and it reacts in a certain way and you do that 99 times, there still is no philosophical assurance that it's going to happen the 100th time. You are basing, you're just projecting based upon past experience. You don't know that for a fact. There is no way you can know anything based upon anything that's happened before. Now, Hume later on had to say, well, yeah, but you can't live like that. <laughs> you know, if you, if you plant corn and marigolds kind of came up, you die. You know, so you have to sort of, the, the reality of human life is you have to believe that there's some aspect of cause and effect. But philosophically, he pulled that apart. And basically, he questioned how we can really know anything. <coughs> Epistemology is the, the philosophical... Um, idea or pursuit of how we know things. How can I know? That's epistemology. I once told a friend of mine that my major area of study had been epistemology, and she said, I think my mom had one of those. <laughs> so, <laughs> and a girl. But epistemology is how do we know things? How can we know? And David Hume, as I say, he was one of my heroes in my secular days. David Hume said, you can't really know. You can only hope that what has always happened before is going to happen again, but you can't know that. Well, that sort of teased reason out of things, and in fact, you get, some, uh, you get a bunch of people come along after Hume and following up on that. Gotthold Lessing, who was one of the great intellectuals of the, and also a, a writer, a playwright, Lessing came along and he said this, the accidental truths of history can never become the proof of necessary truths of reason. The accidental truths of history can never become the proof of necessary truths of reason. What that meant is, and what Hume basically laid the foundation for, is when they say accidental truths, that means things that aren't necessary. They don't have to be. They just happened. But when they talk about the necessary truths of reason, this elevation of reason, which started with Descartes and others, and Hume actually raised reason, and, and, because what he was saying is, you can't use experience to project, so that the only thing you can know for sure are the things that are necessarily true, which means 
mostly mathematics. The things for which experience is, a, is no basis. 1 plus 1 equals 2. The square root of 4 is 2. There are some truths which are considered necessary because they're not based upon any experience in the physical world. They are purely rational. They are purely conceptual. Got that? And so from this whole enlightenment idea, they started relying on reason more and more and more. And then they decided that, in fact, reason was so much the high point that you couldn't count on anything experiential. The accidental truths of history could not be the basis of the necessary truths of reason. Only reason mattered. Well, what happened when they did that was they said anything that happens in history, you can't really draw any conclusions from it because you can't be sure that that was repeatable, that that was you know, a consistent reality. That's an accidental history. It's not a necessary truth. Well, the fact is that God's revelation to us was given to us in history. It was given to us in documents through people who lived in history. And so they began to discount... <laughs> Because they elevated reason, they began to discount the idea of revelation from God as being something that you can't count on because it's an accidental historical revelation. Okay, Accidental doesn't mean, oops, it means not necessary from a reasonable or rational point of view. Okay, now You may not understand all that, but the point in that is that that was a huge blow to this idea that revelation from God is the foundation on which we base our faith, because faith, and therefore faith itself began to be challenged. And that's where we begin to see that spiral, that downward spiral. Well, a reaction against that, that sort of uh, elevation of the, the rational, actually even, you know, even went as far back as David Hume, because David Hume, after saying all this stuff about reason, he then said, but you know, reason is and should be the slave of the passions. It was David Hume, the same guy who was the, the founder of skepticism, said that. Because he said, you know, other than the, the necessary rationality, the, like the mathematical rationalities, you can't count on reason anyway. So from that, you get a whole movement that really started with Friedrich Schleiermacher. Friedrich Schleiermacher, may his name be cursed forever, <laughs> is the founder of yes. modern theology, which means liberal skeptical theology. He, his focus was that, okay, you can't rely on, you know, he, was, he was really liberal, you can't rely on scripture as revelation, you can't rely on any, anything other, anything by reason. He elevated this sense of feelings. He sort of accepted it and said, okay, well, if that's true, and you guys have pretty much discounted anything but reason, I'm going to go the next step and say, but then reason doesn't work. And, and, and Hume even suggested that. And... Schleiermacher said what really matters are our feelings about things. So this is a reaction against the elevation of reason. Schleiermacher comes along and says it's our feeling of dependence upon God. It's our feeling of oneness with God. It's our feeling of God's presence that's most important. Because reason, he thought, was being overplayed. And reason pretty much did away with any idea of God's revelation to us. That, when I say reason, that, that elevation of reason, that hyper-rationality. So you get this feeling emphasis from Schleiermacher. This, boil, this keeps moving until the movement of existentialism moves into the Christian faith. You get Christian existentialism. Now, existentialism is this idea that it's, it's what you experience in your existence, in your day-to-day -day that matters. Okay? Um, existentialism is this idea that it has to work in your real life in order for it to be a reality, for it to be valid, for it to be valuable. Uh, you have to experience things in order for them to, to be legitimate. Rudolf Bultmann, who was um, one of the foremost liberal theologians, uh, after Schleiermacher, he sort of took up that mantle. He lived from the late 1800s to all the way to 1976. It seems like the ones that are wrong always live a lot longer, but I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, but Boltmann comes along, and focusing on existentialism, he agreed that uh, reason was not it. He agreed with Schleiermacher that personal experience was it, but he went further and said he defined revelation as being the human response to the experience of feelings for the divine. What did you say that again? He completely redefined revelation, said revelation is the human response 
to what you perceive as your experience of the divine, your existential experience of the divine. So God was completely unplugged from the thing. Remember earlier I told you that a modern idea is that revelation is the quickening of the human conscience? That's Boltmann. He was one of the main ones who said that um, fairly early in the 20th century. This quickening of the human conscience, this idea that it's my human response to the feelings of the divine, to the feelings of dependence, to the feelings of desire for oneness with God, that's what's important. God completely is taken out of the picture in terms of being responsible for revelation. Do you begin to see, and most of the people today who would say, well, you know, don't bother me with doctrine, I just want to experience a relationship with Jesus. They are basing that, the, the whole thing that got us to that place where people say that now, was liberal theology. It was a rejection of God. It was a rejection of God's revelation. It was a, a, an entire, entirely humanistic, that is based on human experience, a humanistic redefinition of what revelation is. It no longer involves any propositional truth, that is, that God told us certain things that we should know about Him. It's entirely, what do I feel about it? What, how, does, how does that affect me existentially? And so the people who say that, who think they're being so righteous and so pious, are building on the, the foundation laid by liberal philosophers and theologians who do not, did not even believe in the divinity of Jesus, who doubted it for a long time, even the historicity of Jesus, who had no concept at all that God was real and that he had revealed himself to us. They inherited that and don't even know where it came from. So the rejection of propositional truth, this idea that God has told us things about himself that are foundational to what we believe, that we build our faith on that understanding, is based, you take that away and you end up with people who say, I just want to experience Jesus. Okay? Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with experiencing Jesus. We are made new creatures in Him. But unless you also have a founding in the basic truth that God has revealed through the prophets in His Scripture, unless you have a mature sense of God's revelation to you, your faith is going to be the mist. You are going to be the seeds that were scattered on the hard ground yeah. and grew up quickly and then other concerns came and took them away. Right? Mature Christian faith is built upon a, a good, solid sense of God's revelation and of the truth that we receive from that revelation, which we then can experience in relationship with Jesus Christ. So, I give you that. I mean, from, from the Enlightenment, with people like David Hume and Lessing and others, um, and then you know, Kant comes in later and Kant tries to sort of reconcile all that stuff and doesn't help much. Then Schleiermacher, the founder of modern theology, modern liberal theology, and the idea that feelings are the most important. And then Bultmann and the whole Christian existentialist movement that completely removed God from it and said, you know, that to be a Christian means to experience the sense of the divine. That to, you know, the quickening of the conscience, the human response to a desire for God or the divine or whatever it is. Which is exactly where all of the Jesus seminar guys are. Well, I know scripture says that, but I prefer to think, really? And you got that out of what? Bubblegum wrapper? No. Sorry, don't mean to be cynical, but... Uh, questions about that? Uh, help me. Uh, um, Schleiermarker and mm -hmm. Butman. Butman was Bultman. a... Bultman. B-U-L-T-M-A-N-A. -E. B -U -L -T -M -A -N -A. Okay. He was a he was a disciple, a disciple, would you say, or a student of Shire, Shire Mark? Uh, I don't know that there was any formal relationship. Where, where is, my question is, I, I've read some Bart and I've read some uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and, and that name Schleiermacher, Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher. He's one of the foremost, you know, as I say, he's the he's the father of modern liberal theology. You can't get away from Schleiermacher. Everything was either in agreement with him or or in disagreement with him. Okay. Uh, Bart and Bonhoeffer would have written very distinctly in disagreement, in disagreement with him. Yeah. Uh, but and Niebuhr and others. Now he was in Germany, wasn't he? Schleiermacher. Uh, yes. So the name like Schleier, Friedrich Schleiermacher. Yes. Well, again, the back to that German well, theologian. the German so theologians were like, Rudolf Bultmann. Yeah. Bultmann, same thing. Don't confuse Bultmann with Moltmann. Bultmann, bad. Moltmann, good. 
<laughs> old man bad. Okay. Um, and again, I'm, I, if I were being more serious academically, I'd try to give him more credit because Bultmann was brilliant, but he was wrong. From any evangelical perspective, he was mistaken. Okay. Uh, no matter how hard you look at it. Okay? That's one of the advantages of us having our own institute here without having some denomination accrediting us or something is that we can talk about what we believe is true or not. And you all don't have to agree with me, but that's where we're coming from. Um, any other questions about that? Yes, Chris. Just one quick one. Okay, but mature faith, would it, 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 it should obviously include understanding the word and understanding all about that. Right. But wouldn't then it also have some experience? Oh, that? absolutely. Uh, please, I've, I, I think I've tried to say that yeah, two or three sure. times. Yeah, you did. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. If there is not an experience of conversion, if there is not a sense in which, you know, I have been made new, that I am not the same creature I was before, as Scripture talks about, then I have a problem. Then it's all an intellectual pursuit, and, and this is not an intellectual pursuit. That doesn't mean that the intellect shouldn't be part of it. You know, when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, why don't we listen to him? He was saying this can't be just an emotional thing. He's saying this can't be just an intellectual thing. Um, he's saying this can't be something you just that you do on Sundays. And yet this idea uh, about what what feels good being the source of it, I I preached at a little chapel last week, and it's a sermon I've preached before. It's, it's, I've never preached a sermon more than once at this church, at our church. But when I preach somewhere else, I sometimes do take a past sermon and redo it. I preached on the Beatitudes there. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, for there's the kingdom of God, and on and on. And I make the point there that nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to watch a TV show called, you know, Lifestyles of the Meek and Mournful. They want to watch Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Okay? They want to have something that allows them some glimpse into the lives of these people that they envy. And I said, but the point is, everything that Jesus says... In, the, ten, in the, the Beatitudes is contrary to the foundational values of Western culture today. Take them one at a time. You know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and on and on. That's not what people want to hear. And when I preach that sermon there, and it's not the first time I've had this reaction, people have come up to me and said, you know, I never thought about it that way. And I have to confess, I thought to myself, well, how in the world did you think about it? How can you think about it any other way? Jesus was plain in what he's saying. And I'm not trying to pick on them. Again, they're not the only ones that, that that's the case for. And yet, we don't think about the fact that the reason that's in there is because he meant it. And he meant for us to know it. And he meant for us to live it and experience it. Those are propositional truths. That it is better to be meek. It is better... You know, that, that happiness does not come from what you possess. Happiness actually comes from longing. That the root to happiness is to long for the things of God and have God satisfy that. Okay? And yet, that doesn't feel good. All right? That doesn't feel the way I like to feel. And so I said, there's, there's two answers. You, you recognize that the way the world tells you you're going to be happy is wrong. It's wrong. You're not going to get happy that way. And then you stop pursuing those things. Stop reading catalogs. Stop, you know, all the rest of the stuff that we do. Having things is not inherently wrong. Expecting those things to make you happy is. Those are propositional truths. And yet, you know what? The idea that I find joy in longing, that I find joy in, in mourning, which is what Jesus was really saying, to completeness, of fulfillment, that's what blessed is. Um, that doesn't feel good. I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel well. So many people's Christian faith is wrong and immature and shallow and will be blown away at the first strong wind because they do not understand that it is not based upon what feels good. Yes, there is that. That we are given blessedness, joy. Grace, completeness, satisfaction. But that's not feel good. That's not the same thing as feel good. Okay? And I see that all the time. And we don't even know that there's actually a historical route that we can track that talked people into thinking that way. 
I've really got to do a class. In fact, I, I, I may make this one of our institute classes. I did a class called What's Wrong with the World? And what I, it's, I took that title from G.K. Chesterton, one of G.K. Chesterton's books, one of my books. But my class had nothing to do with Chesterton's book. I just liked the title. It fit. I went through and I looked at all of these philosophers and theologians and the people who have, who have created our way of thinking in the early 21st century Western culture and said, you may not know that if you think this way or feel this way, you can thank Immanuel Kant. You can thank George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. You can thank Friedrich Schleiermacher, because they said it first. And, you, and we assume that these things are inherently true. They're not inherently true. Somebody came up with that and sold it to you, and you didn't know it. Okay? So we need to understand some of history to understand some of that. Not that I feel strongly about these things. <laughs> okay? Questions about that? There is truth. God has revealed it to us. And Schleiermacher and Kant, and I mean the brilliant guys, and they said some wonderful things too, um, and Bultmann and others, mostly they were wrong about this. Rod? It's probably really good for our Johnny background to learn <laughs> these things, yeah. and you can understand and feel it better. Or... Yeah, I, and, and I can say that um, I had made a profession of faith when I was in high school. See, that's one of the things that's different about us in most seminaries is you don't get your professors talking like this in most, most seminaries. I made a profession of faith in high school and it was very real, but it was shallow because I didn't have any, back, back, any founding for it. I didn't come from a Christian home. I had not grown up in church and Sunday school and all that kind of stuff. And I got to college and got into intellectual pursuits and was enamored of, of Hegel and Kant and Hume. Those were like my trinity, you know, when I was really pursuing intellectual things. Uh, and... and and some others, like Kierkegaard, if you've ever tried to read Kierkegaard, if you can read the first page of Sickness Unto Death, which is this small book by Kierkegaard, if you can read the first page and tell me what it means, I will give you $500. Okay? Because I don't think anybody really knows what that means. He was an existentialist. Now, Kierkegaard was a man of great faith. He really was a believer, I think. But, man, he was a whole different place. Anyway. And so I started following these guys, and I thought... <clears throat> You know, the old saying, I'm going to stand on the shoulders of giants. That I, I, would, I would start where they started, and I would pursue intellectual things, and I would be able to see over into infinity. I would achieve intellectual greatness, okay? Only thing was, after a period of time, I realized how horribly miserable I was. I was cynical and angry and unpleasant and, you know, awful to be around, and, you know, and this went on for a long time. Uh, sometimes I still am, I guess. But um, but it wasn't until I, I saw, I met two people who I thought were wonderful people who were not intellectually you know, significant. They were not great scholars. They were not anything other than just wonderful people with wonderful hearts that anybody would find admirable. And I said, you know, I don't care if they're not brilliant intellectuals like I want to be. I, I think I want to be like that. And that, they were Christians, they were very committed believers, and that brought me back to what I had professed as the truth earlier. And now, though, I was able to build a foundation for it. Okay. So, I know these guys well, and I know how screwed up you can get if that's your whole focus. But I also know that there are too many people who believe that they're being on fire for Jesus, when in fact all they're doing is following Schleiermacher and, and Bultmann and these guys and saying that it's what I feel that's important. That, think, that's not the truth. I think the key is, is what are you running after? What do you run after? Yeah. And, and some people will run after the emotion and other people, if you, if you run after Christ, then you, you, you're faced with this reasonable reaction to meeting the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, exactly. which is very explosive. Right. But the people, you, you make a fine argument about <laughs> the danger of pursuing this hidden agenda where I want to be pleased, yeah. you know, and that's really prevalent. Yeah, it's, it's all about me, yeah. and that's what that boils down to. Is exactly. basically, it's all about me. The whole, the whole Christian faith is about me. Jesus died for me, and it's true He died for you, but He didn't. He didn't just die for you. I'm sorry. You know, um, the idea is that it is the glory of God that's preeminent. It is not me and how I feel about it. Right? And it takes some maturity to be able to recognize that and live in that. But it is not all about me. 
Okay, last thing is I want to give you that special revelation occurs in three ways, historically. First, it is through the spoken word from God. God spoke, as I said earlier, to Adam, to Noah, Abraham, Moses, the prophets, etc. Now, sometimes, some, some writers actually classify this as, a, as its own kind of revelation, called direct revelation, meaning that God speaks directly to a person. This was Moses at the burning bush, you know, he saw the manifestation of God in a bush that was not consumed, and he heard the voice of God speak. Um, but usually it is seen as part of special revelation, because it is, it is God using supernatural means, not the natural world, but supernatural means to, to communicate person to person. Usually, in direct revelation, it's, God does that in order for that person, prophet, apostle, Bible writer, whoever, to then communicate that message on to the next people. So that God speaks directly in order that that person can, can communicate. That's what the definition of a prophet is, is one who speaks for God. It's not one who tells the future. It's one who speaks for God. It may involve telling the future, but it's mostly, mostly not, more often than not. So that's one, is to, to, uh, through the spoken word from God. The second is through written word from God. Those that receive the word, the prophets and apostles, to write it down for our sakes, so that that truth is communicated to us in Scripture. And the third way is through the word made flesh, the revelation of God through the incarnate Christ. That God communicated um, virtually everything. I mean, he, he communicated about himself and his nature previously. But the communication about God's nature was perfected in the presence of the incarnate Christ, who was without sin, who saw the hearts of people, who, who manifested what it was to be the loving and yet powerful God in our very presence, uh, and who saved us. So those are the three ways in which God did and um, did communicate in terms of special revelation, spoken word, written word, and word made flesh. Now today, I believe God does sometimes speak to, to individuals um, by the Holy Spirit, which means that it's still possible to have direct revelation today. There's nothing that says that I can't be. It certainly is true, and this is the most common way today, that God reveals himself to us in his written word. Through scripture. That's why studying scripture is the most important thing you can do. Every study that has been done, especially the big one that, uh, that uh, Willow Creek Church, they did a survey, if you're in the How to Study the Bible class, you've heard this. They did a survey of 250,000 church attenders to identify first where those people were in their Christian walk, and secondly, what was the uh, things in order what were the things that had allowed them to grow most in their Christian faith and to feel the most satisfaction with their Christian walk? By far, the most important thing to help people grow in their faith and feel satisfaction in their Christian walk and to actually move to you know, more intimate levels of relationship with God was reading the Bible. It was an experience of God's Word. Why is that? Because that's the predominant way that God reveals Himself today. The Word is a living thing. Why is it living? Because God is active through the Holy Spirit and making it alive to us in our lives. It is, it is not often today that God speaks directly to us. I mean, we may feel that God is an answer to prayer or something. That's legitimate. We certainly experience the Word made flesh, but that is something we experience because the Holy Spirit makes that a reality to us based upon what we have been given in the written Word. See, the bot people say, well, I think Jesus is more important than the Bible. Well, yeah, but where did you hear about Jesus? Where do we learn about Jesus? Either you experienced it from the written word, or you experienced it from someone who witnessed to you who got it from the written word, or they got it from someone who had gotten it from the written word. The reason the Holy Spirit makes the, whole, the, the written word of God's scripture alive for us is because that is where we are introduced to Jesus, the word made flesh. I had somebody, uh, another minister one time, tell me, well, yet the church would exist even if there was no Bible. And I said, well, yeah, God can do any, anything he wants. God could have found some other way to do it. But the fact is that everything on which we base our faith is revealed to us in Scripture, including the nature of Jesus. God can miraculously convey understanding to people today, yes. But how often does he do that compared to the number of times when God speaks to us through his written word? Not very often. So that is the primary way that God gives his revelation to us today. Through the writing of the prophets, the apostles, and the disciples who, in addition to the apostles, who wrote, who wrote the New Testament. Any questions about any of that? Doctrine of Revelation. Bob? Where do dreams and visions fit in? 
Well, that would come under the, when I say spoken word, that's the direct revelation that God has communicated directly to you. Um, spoken word might, might not sound like it includes images or visions, but really that would fall under that because all of those are part of the kind of direct revelation of God. But those are also the most dangerous because those, those are the ones that are most likely to be misunderstood or for people to make claims about them. Again, you had really bad meatloaf and all of a sudden you think you're the only one who's ever gotten this right from God. I don't know what, what Joseph Smith had for dinner so, before he started so you're, all this. You're not, you're not limiting that to the historical perspective. You're uh, saying that that, that it's, possibly could happen now. It's possible still today, but... Um, yeah, 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 but we understand the word. The word yeah. is the is the is the, right. the the fuente. But not in any way that would counter what exactly. God has spoken before. Exactly. Is the is the most important part of that? Okay. <coughs> God does communicate to them. You remember when we started this class, I talked about um, you know how does God reveal Himself? And I said the first way, the most important and the most authoritative way, was through the written word. The second way was through the church down through history. Mm -hmm. God has spoken through His church. In effect, that's what he did with the prophets. Not all the prophets wrote. Okay? That's what he did through, you know, um, Peter and Paul when they preached. You know, he spoke through the church. And that the creeds reflect that, for instance. The third way is through general revelation, through God revealing himself in the created world that he, that he made. You can see God's nature in that. And the fourth way is through, revel through him speaking to individuals, revelation individuals. Those are in descending order of, of authority. First the written word, then God speaking through the church down through history, then what we experience in the reality of the world, and then as God reveals himself to individuals. When I say individuals, it can be a, an individual or it can be our board of elders. Um, if our board of elders even came back and said, well, we think that, you know, that everything in the world happened by accident and we're going to start teaching that, I go, no, we're not. Our, because scripture says no, and then the third one, you know, the... I believe that there's there's no way you can defend that in terms of what we experience in God's revelation of the creative order. And so, there's a hierarchy there. But all of them are um, a version of revelation. In fact, if you go back and look at that, we said God's revelation through Scripture, God's revelation through the church, God's revelation through uh, the natural order, God's revelation through individuals. And that takes in what you were asking, Bob, in terms of visions or any, any other sorts of things. That's a revelation God gives to individuals. When we ask him for direction and guidance, I believe he gives it to us, either directly or sometimes by speaking through a, a brother or sister in the Lord. Anything else? That's it for today. I'm letting you out seven minutes early. Parte. Um, again, all of these notes, including these things, are online. You can uh, access them. If you don't have internet access, I will give you. I've got printed out copies right here. Assignment for next week is prepare for the exam. And let me say again, some of you are going to start panicking. Let me say again, nothing will be on the test that is not in the printed what you should know document that I that's online or that I can give you. Not everything that's on that document will be on the test. The document is much longer than the test will be. Everything on the test will be multiple choice, so you don't have to remember the whole, memorize the whole document. You simply have to know it well enough to recognize it when you see it. Um, what else? What other questions? If Pat Courtney were here, she'd have five other questions for me because she's she's test phobic. Is it open book? Yeah, somebody else already asked that. All right. God bless you all. Thank you. We will see you next week.